Good morning and welcome to the show. This morning the topic is the historical black colleges and we have to talk about that topic. Uh, a very distinguished person from the uh, community as well as from one of our area universities, Dr. Henry Punder, who is the president of Fisk University. And let me welcome you to the show this morning, Dr. Punder. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. Dr. Punder, this is the uh, third of, a couple, uh, of three shows that we are doing dealing with the Afro-American History Month. And what we'd like to do this morning is to talk about uh, historical black colleges. And I think that there's no uh, person who is better qualified to talk about historical black colleges than yourself because it is your institution that is generally recognized as one of the first historical black colleges. And so why don't you give us as much information as you'd like to give us this morning concerning the history of historical black colleges? Well, I think one of the things that the public seem not to be aware of is that probably one of the miracles of this country has been the historical black colleges and what they have been able to do for the country. Now, let's back up just a little bit uh, when we were about 1920, uh, not very many of our people were literate, and then our colleges got started, and finally now we have a very literate population. But let's move on back further. During uh, times of slavery, it was against the law to teach black people to read or write. And as a matter of fact, the penalty for teaching a person to read or write was even greater than murdering someone. Uh, if you taught a person to read or write, they would kill you or cut your hand off or put your eyes out or cut your tongue out, just to let you know how, how much people knew the value of an education. And that's the thing I wish that we could, I'll digress a moment, I wish we could get that across to our youngsters today, that the most important thing that you can have is an education. No one can take that from you. You have it and you can continue to do. But let's move back to the history of our institutions. The first African-American college or university is Cheney State University in uh, Cheney, Pennsylvania, founded in 1836. That is the first one. It is a state institution, but it was not founded as a state institution. It was founded as a private institution uh, back at that time. Then after that, we had Wilberforce coming in, a few others. Then out in Jefferson City, you had Lincoln University that was started by one of the Civil War regiments, that black regiments that fought out there. And then finally, you come to Fisk University in 1866, was set up. Now, let's put the colleges in perspective. Now, keep in mind that at the end of the Civil War, very few African Americans could read or write. So we call these colleges, yes, but when they first started, keep in mind that they had to teach people the basics of reading and writing. So they were really uh, elementary schools. Uh, the first three grades, one through three, and then when a person finished the third grade, they would go back into the community and teach others one to three. And then finally we got people up through the ninth grade. And those in the ninth grade would go out and teach others. And then finally we got people through high school and they would go back and teach. Now that's a, an evolutionary process that took a long time. And then finally we got into colleges and universities. Fisk University was one of the first four-year co uh, African-American colleges in the country. But and, and another thing that we need to understand is these universities have never been segregated. The private institutions have never been segregated. The public institutions were segregated by law in the states where they were represented. Now, if you take Fisk University, for example, we have always had uh, non-black students here. We've had white students in our population ever since it started. Now, some people say, oh, that couldn't be in 18... 65 or 1875, whites wouldn't come to Fisk. But you have to understand the dynamics of the time. We had first white missionaries who were teaching at Fisk University. They came here dedicated to help a group of people that needed education. So they came. When they came, they brought their families with them. They had children who were ready for elementary or high school or, or college. And keep in mind, that these persons who worked at Fisk University and others of our institutions were ostracized by the city. Mm -hmm. So there, the people that they had the camaraderie with were those that were at the black colleges. So their children then enrolled at these institutions. So we've had white students uh, all along. And really, we've, we had more before the Supreme Court decision of uh, Brown versus Board of Education mm -hmm. in, eight, in 1954. Since that time, that's when persons became very conscious of it, mm -hmm. and now white students seem to be making a conscious effort 
not to attend these universities, not because the universities don't want them, but because they are now making the choice of going elsewhere. Now, in that same process, we have uh, African-American youngsters who are exercising the option to go to other institutions. And persons are saying, well, there's really no need for these institutions now because black youngsters can go any place. But the problem with that statement is, why do we always say black youngsters can go to white institutions? We never say that white youngsters can come mm -hmm. to black institutions. Now, the other thing is, given where we are in education today, we need more colleges and universities, not fewer colleges and universities. If all of the youngsters who graduate from high school this May would go someplace in this country to college or university, we wouldn't have enough space for them. So instead of talking about closing our institutions, we ought to talk about making them str stronger, and that's what we're all about now. Uh, Dr. L uh, Lovett uh, from the History Department at Tennessee State University appeared before you, Dr. Ponder, and he gave us some information relative to uh, the shortage of uh, uh, black teachers in the uh, whole system. And I know from just casually reading the newspaper that you've done quite a bit in terms of trying to deal with this as a problem, the shortage of uh, teachers, uh, especially black teachers. Why don't you give us some information in reference to where we stand uh, on that as a problem today? Well, I think what we need to understand is that it is not just a shortage of teachers in the public school system. That's what we usually think of. There's a tremendous shortage there. Let me say that right off. But we have a shortage of African-American professionals at all levels of this society. In any career that you talk about, any educational discipline that you talk about, we are grossly underrepresented in terms of our percentage of the population. Now, one of the reasons for this is that somehow our youngsters have been turned off to the education system. And that's what educators today must do. We must do something about making sure that these youngsters get turned on to the system. But if we don't do something about that, just look when we come to the 21st century, in the year 2000, overwhelmingly the majority of the school age population will be other than white. Minorities as we call them, but I fail to see how it can be a minority when it's the majority of the population. But there will be that, Hispanics, uh, Asian Americans, and African Americans. Now when you get those kinds of statistics, we need more African American, Hispanics, Native Americans, and so forth teaching in the classroom. Now, some people say, well, it really doesn't make any difference. But it does make a difference in this country. The reason it makes a difference is because color does make a difference in this country. And somehow, you cannot erase all of what happened over 200 years of slavery in the years since then. People still have opinions about color. And, and I'm not defending it. I'm just saying that's the way it is. Now, what we need in the classroom are some persons of color so that students of color can see these persons and say, look, if he can do that or if she can do that, so can I. That's why it is so important for us to do something to make sure we get more African Americans graduating from high school, entering college and university, graduating with bachelor's degrees, and then going on to master's, PhDs, MDs, law degrees, and so forth. Now, not only are you concerned, Dr. Punder, with uh, the fact of uh, the shortage uh, dealing with historical black institutions, but you're also concerned in terms of uh, the uh, black education situation from an international point of view. And we do understand that quite recently you made a trip to Africa. And I'd like for you now to sort of give us a report in terms of what you saw in Africa, because I think that uh, over the last few months, there's been this sort of peace dividend that we talk about, and there's been a turning away from the third world and uh, an emphasis now upon uh, uh, reorganization of Europe and et cetera, and we've simply neglected or not paid as much attention to Africa as perhaps we should. So why don't you give us some information relative to the problems that you encountered in terms of Africa? That is so true, and let me make two statements in the beginning. If I were just graduating from college today, Africa, here I come. That is the place where a youngster has a chance now. And I mean, whether I'm African American or white, that's still where I would go. Because keep in mind that most of the natural resources of this planet are located on that continent. So you can go there and they need someone to help them mine the gold, mine the diamonds, mine all of the things. And these countries are becoming nationalized, meaning they're nationalistic. They are concerned about the fact that they are now sending all of their resources to Europe or someplace else, and then they're buying it back at twice the cost. So if I were a youngster, I'd go there and help them do that. 
The other thing that I'd like to say is that it's, it's really deplorable that our country has taken the attitude about Africa that it has taken. Uh, it's too valuable in terms of the assets they have for us to take that. One of these days, those countries are going to become self-determining uh, and independent of all of these other things. It'd be nice if America would be the country of record that would help them move into the 21st century. So I would hope that our country gets into that. Now, what did I find? I, I have visited most of the sub-Saharan countries in Africa, I, I would say 16 or 17 in all, I find the same thing every place. They want someone to help them do what needs to be done. They would prefer that that would be African Americans from this country. But they're not choosy in that regard because they can't afford to be. But other things being equal, if we had African Americans, they would prefer those. And I know that. I've talked with them, and I know that. I've talked to the university people, and they are concerned, but they need some basic things. For example, they almost have no textbooks at any level, elementary, high school, or university level. Any textbooks that we could send to them. Uh, and again, it doesn't make any difference how old they are, because if you have no textbooks, a textbook that's 10 years old is still a good textbook. That's the thing that we tend to forget. Our teachers think that when a textbook gets two years old, it's outdated, so we have to get a new one. Well, that's nice, and that's a part of development. But in those countries, they need just the basic things. In Uganda, for example, that they've had civil strife there. You, you know that. And uh, for the first time in my life, I got a, a clear understanding of what the war between the states cost us. I got a clear understanding of it. We devastated our country in that war, and we destroyed property and machinery and resources. Mm -hmm. I'd read that and I knew it, but I didn't have a working knowledge of it. When I went to Uganda as a, an adult and I looked at what happened, and, and let me just give you some ideas. We visited some of the universities and some of the technical schools and uh, public schools and so forth. We visited, and what we found, see these, these are countrymen warring against each mm -hmm. other. One group would come in and take this location, another would fight with them and run them out. When the last group left, they had stripped the buildings, the, the, college, the uh, high school buildings, of everything they could move. They took out the commodes in the bathroom, they took the mirrors off the wall, they took the doorknobs off, they took the doors off, they took all the typewriters, they took all of the uh, everything. That was just, just the shell of buildings. Now, Here's a country that's devastated. How in the world can they ever build that infrastructure back? Mm -hmm. That's what they want. And I was on a group that was there trying to talk with them about how we can set up a system whereby we can do some fundamental things. Get some typewriters in you so youngsters can learn to type. Uh, all of those are gone now. They once had them. Uh, this is the place where the country is green. It has a lot of agriculture. Talk with the young man that had a thousand acres of banana, they, they grow everything there, bananas and coconuts and grain, the, the works, pineapples, they grow all of it and grow it very well. And he was saying to me, I would like to have someone who would provide the machinery. I would give them half interest in my 1,000 acre farm if they would simply provide the machinery from the United States so that I could do what I need. Now he is dealing with a thousand acres and he's doing it with oxen and with hand tools. Now just imagine in this country trying to do that. That's, that's the thing. But that's how far back. Now, what we have tried to do is to set up some relationships with those universities whereby we would have our students go there, our faculty go there and help, and for their students and faculty to come here. It's a faculty student exchange program. But here's what's difficult about it. We've had difficulty getting our government to finance this so that we can invite those persons over. They don't have the money to send one of their students over here. Now, we might be able to send one of our students there and continue that whatever the student was paying to us, just let it go and let him pay there. But when their student comes here, they wouldn't have the resources so that they could pay that student's way. So it's, get, it's very difficult. Now, I'm not only talking about 
sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. We went to Egypt. We have a big project in Egypt that uh, is run by Clark Atlanta University. It's about a $10 million project mm -hmm. in healthcare. And we're running that with them. We have some agricultural products uh, programs going. We went to Tunisia, talked with the people there, and they gave us the opportunity to send some students there to learn French. That's a French-speaking country. And uh, the other thing that I must say can, kind of in a, in a cute way, it was amazing to me that as we, every country I visited, every place I went, even the person on the street could speak English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I could never speak anything but English. When they started speaking French, I had to get an interpreter. To say. One of the chilling things is uh, I was in Togo this in, in November. And I was there as, as a special guest of the government so that uh, they were celebrating that the 20th year of Benin University, their state university. I was the official spokesperson uh, there for this country. I didn't go as a representative of my country. They invited me mm. as an official person there, so I was a spokesperson. Here's a big audience of people with the television cameras every place. They called on me to speak. Now, I stood up and spoke in English. Persons had to translate. They didn't have to translate mm -hmm. what was being said. But when they spoke in French, I didn't have the mm -hmm. foggiest idea of what they were saying. Mm -hmm. Now, that's because in our country we don't put much stress on foreign languages, and I think we must begin to do that. Another experience uh, that uh, I can tell you about, uh, we had a chance to go to uh, Swaziland. Uh, we met the uh, brother of the king there in, in, in this country. Mm -hmm. The king is a young fellow, about 26 years old, and uh, he is traveling all over the country trying to get people to do that. But we were there the weekend of the king's birthday. And on the king's birthday, all of the unmarried maidens in the mm -hmm. state, in the country, are fair game for him. He can mm -hmm. just, see, on that day, he can pick either one of them and mm -hmm. they're his bride. Now, mm -hmm. in their country, they, you know, they believe in polygamy, so they can have uh, 16, 20, 30 wives, that's all right. So we had a lot of fun in, during that time. Mm -hmm. But again, the, the thing that stressed that I caught was when we talked to the youngsters at the school, they saw that it's time for us to let this kind of thing go. Mm -hmm. Then we went over to Namibia. And uh, again, this is a beautiful country. It was uh, once a part of South Africa. Uh, but now the country is run. The good thing about this is that the president and most of the cabinet officers mm -hmm. have had training in the African-American colleges and mm -hmm. universities in this country. So we did not have to sell them on the value of our institutions. It was the, the one place where we did not have to sell that. They knew that. They simply said, we want to work with you. Well, what do you do, do, Dr. Pundrick, excuse me, what do you do in order to convince American policymakers of the importance of some of the things that you're talking about doing? Because uh, in terms of uh, dollars and cents, uh, that you would put on some kind of international uh, exchange program, uh, we could certainly gain much more out of it than the few dollars that we might put into it in terms of support. There's no question about that. And uh, though, you know, I love this country and would, would do nothing to damage it in PR or anything, but I think somehow we're still talking about this color thing. It's, it's a color thing because we're talking about a country that is run by uh, persons of color and with a lot of resources and our country will not invest in that but we, we've already put more money into Eastern Europe since the, since the wall went down than we have put into Africa in the last five or ten years. That's what you, you wonder what in, the, what in the world is going on now. I think it's because we just have not come to think of that and someone keeps saying that I'm afraid that I'll lose my money. See, they're, they're so prone to revolution. They're so prone to nationalizing things. Uh, I think this is the problem. I didn't mention it. I was in South Africa. And I think the problem there is one of these days, the South Africans are going to be in charge of that country. And they have an awful lot of resources. And it would be nice if our country would be the country of record when they decide to do business, but we're just not doing it. Very good. Doctor, uh, during these last few minutes that we've got left, why not uh, let us look at uh, some of the progress that has been made at your institution and uh, in a real sense to sort of give the community sort of a report card 
on what you've done since uh, the last time that we talked, we had an opportunity to talk to you about uh, your institution. Well, I certainly appreciate that. I, I believe you said that from time to time you'd give me the opportunity to give a report card to the city, and uh, I really appreciate that, let me tell you. Uh, so I want to thank you and the station for allowing us to do that. Uh, our enrollment continues to increase every year. Uh, this fall, our enrollment was over 900 students, 916. That's an increase from uh, when, when I was here the last time. We were probably around 600 students. So we've constantly had an increase every year uh, since that time. So that's improving. The other thing is that we are beginning to do things on the campus. Uh, in the next uh, few months, we will have construction going on with our little theater and with the uh, music annex. And then 12 months or so from now, we will be renovating uh, the chapel, getting ready for the centennial year in 1992, and we will put a roof on the administration building. Then after that, we will go after some more funds to get others. And I want to thank our congressional delegation from Tennessee for helping us get these funds through uh, the Department of Interior, through the historical preservation. So we have all of that going. If you look around the campus, it looks a lot better. Mm -hmm. We have given faculty raises, so they're doing much better in terms of the money. Not as much as we'd like to give them. Another thing is we've just picked up a matching grant from the Mott Foundation, uh, $500,000, and we said that we wanted this for an endowment for teacher salaries. If we're going to keep good teachers, we must pay them, and we know that. So we asked for this. We must match those funds, and we intend to do that. Then we'll have an endowment of over a million dollars when we put that together. The endowment today, I think the last time I was here, we were talking about an endowment of maybe 1.5 million. The d endowment today is 3.5 million mm -hmm. and growing. So we think that we've done some good things and a lot of people have worked. Our alumni have continued to contribute to us. They've increased their giving each year. This past year, they gave us over a half million dollars in terms of total contribution. They are projecting $650,000 for next year. Corporations and foundations are continuing to help, and the city of Nashville certainly is helpful. And, I, and I, again, I want to thank you and uh, this station because I think appearing here has also been of tremendous help to us. And before I finish, let me say that we're also now doing things in the public arena. Mm -hmm. For example, we decided last year when Nelson Mandela was uh, released that each year we would celebrate this day as Freedom Day mm -hmm. at Fisk Campus. So in, on February the 11th coming up, we're going to have an all-day seminar, different mm -hmm. subjects. We're going to invite different ethnic groups, different nationalities around the Middle Tennessee area to come in and talk about it. The theme is, how can we start a movement mm -hmm. that will give us world peace? We think it's time for us to start talking about that, that different people come in and talk about it. And we invite everyone to come out. It's going to be a day of uh, just talking about what we can do to help the peace efforts on this planet, because we know that if we keep having war, mm -hmm. something awful is going to happen somewhere down the road. Two more final statements, Dr. We would uh, like for you to uh, deal with. Uh, first is the uh, fact that you are the uh, president the national president of uh, one of the uh, fraternities, Alpha Fraternity. <coughs> Excuse me. And exactly what does that mean? And, 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 and how can such an organization help us deal with some of the problems that we have to deal with today? Well, and following that, I would also like for you to speak to uh, the United Negro College Fund, okay. because uh, I think that those two organizations play very, very important parts. Both are very valuable uh, today. Uh, the Alpha Phi Fraternity Incorporated was, is the oldest of the uh, African-American Greek led organizations founded at Cornell University in 1906. It was designed, and, and its motto is, first of all, servants of all. So we believe in serving and serving others, and we work hard at it. Uh, our college chapters and our alumni chapters uh, throughout this country and uh, in some of the foreign countries, we have chapters located in Germany and uh, uh, Korea and other places. But we have a project that we call a Alpha Aid. And what we do is try to get young men and young women, for that matter, to understand that they ought to stay in school. We had a slogan once that said, uh, go to high school, go to college campaign. Mm -hmm. We want youngsters to stay in school. We were the first group to officially recognize publicly that 
men had as much to do with teen pregnancy mm -hmm. as women. We were the first to call in the young mm -hmm. men to tell mm -hmm. them what they ought to be mm -hmm. doing. And we've had the March of Dying to come in and help mm -hmm. us run these kinds of programs. So we're doing, we're doing those kinds of things and we will, we will continue to do that. Now, the United Negro College Fund, uh, we all know that slogan of mine is a terrible thing to waste. And there are 41 institutions involved in this. Uh, we have a telethon each year here in Nashville. And let me again say to everyone who participated in the telethon on December 29th past, thank you very much. We raised more money than we've ever raised, mm -hmm. over $200,000. All of that will go to help provide scholarships for deserving youngsters and to help faculty members who want to take a year off to study or to uh, write books or some other kinds of uh, sabbatical leave. So this organization is very important. Uh, we raise over uh, $45, $45 million a year, and we're still climbing. We have a capital campaign going now for $200 million to help us do some of the things that we want. Half of that money goes for endowments. We need that. Uh, Ambassador Annenberg gave us $50 million on, to start on this, so we have only 150 to go. We've raised about another 50, so we're probably halfway home now on that. It's something that I'm proud that Middle Tennessee works very hard at. They realize the value of Fisk University. Mm -hmm. It is Fisk University. When you hear UNCF in this area, you're helping Fisk University when you help that. So if you want to make contributions to UNCF, send the check UNCF to Fisk University. Mm -hmm. We'd appreciate it very much. Very good. Doctor, we've got two minutes. Uh, any final comments that you'd like to make in reference to some of the things that you're involved in or anything else uh, during these two minutes? Well, let me say that uh, the international arena is going to be the thing that we must deal with uh, as we move into the 21st century. We must decide that we're going to teach our youngsters foreign languages. I think that every youngster that finishes high school now ought to be able to speak a minimum of two languages other than English. Mm -hmm. And I think as you go through college, it ought to be even more. And we ought to become proficient at it. The, the person on the street ought to be able to do that, not just persons who are, have gone through college. So I think we need to get ready for that. The other thing is the technological world is with us, so we must train our youngsters in technological ways so that they can handle all of the equipment that will be thrown at them. Just an example, we were looking at the war that's going on, and I'm, I'm not for the war at all, but you notice that our Patriot missiles went up and every time one of the scrubs came through, they knocked it down. That's technology that's doing that. And the main thing about that is you have to have people who understand that to fire those missiles. Now, if we don't train our youngsters better, then even with those sophisticated mm -hmm. weapons, we won't be able to use them. So we must get into the technological race and, very good. and win it. Let me thank you, Dr. Ponder, for coming by and giving us that uh, very, very important information about your institution as well as uh, the other issues that you covered today. And again, let me encourage you to tune in again next week for another informative edition of Comments. Good morning. to sell at the John F. Lawhon building. New furniture inventories have been marked for immediate